<laughs> oh, please. <laughs> the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, and God, and Elizabeth, with liberty and justice for all. Um, welcome to the March 11th meeting. The General Assembly just declared um, it no more day in Rhode Island, and that's against uh, domestic violence. And so just to have a moment for everybody that goes through that. They just voted on that a few minutes ago in the General Assembly. Thank you. Carol, you want to move that up? Okay. I'll make a motion for the consent agenda. Second. Oh, here you are. Hi. <laughs> Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Mr. Barrett? Unified basketball uh, at the high school. Uh, these are volunteer positions. Uh, John McKinnon and David Landock. Uh, boys tennis coach, uh, John Pelletier. Unified basketball middle school, again, a volunteer position, Brandon Chase. And teacher assistant, which is uh, an existing position in our uh, budget, Donna McCumber. Okay, thank you, and thank you for those people volunteering for the Unified. It's a wonderful program. I'd like to make a motion to move up item 6C and 6D. Second. All those in favor? Okay, 6C, spotlight on success. High school first, please. Adam Tracy from the high school is here to talk about the giant man in the back behind Mrs. Black. So, <laughs> how's it going? Good afternoon. We were, uh, we were asked to come and kind of talk about a project that we did um, about a month back. Uh, I'm Adam Tracy, Zach Fenster, uh, Cole, Mikey, Skyla and Livia and we're here to there was a few of us other of us that worked on it as well but they couldn't make it tonight uh, we're basically just asked to talk about a project so um, sometime in February Linda Larson had gone to the Newport County Education Summit and made a connection with a woman from Ballard Park uh, they have a thing for the Winterfest called Illumination Gardens basically it's one of their pub, uh, public parks that artists can go and bring different uh, lit up pieces of artwork too and there's tons of different things you basically submit an idea and if you're accepted you can put it in their their display so we su we came up with an idea and and uh, submitted it basically I have a group of kids that I meet with on Tuesdays we stay after school and we just kind of do a bunch of different cool projects so I thought this is a good project for this crew so uh, we met and they'll kind of explain a bit more about it uh, so Mikey well we wanted something that everyone could connect to being in the area, so Caw Hog Man, we came up with. Uh, also, um, what's, his other, what's his name? Manny Silva. There was a whole story, though. There's, yeah, there's a whole comic book strip and everything story on. His name's Manny Sylvia. Uh, <laughs> and it was uh, featured in the Herald, Farver Herald News, the Newport Daily News, and on Channel 10, yeah. Nightly News. We all kind of got together and painted a big guy over there and the sign too. So we of us just got together and painted the whole thing. And then while they were painting, a few of us got together in the wood shop and we planned out how we would set it up so it could stand in the garden. Uh, the other cool thing we did when we worked on it, we did this all in one afternoon, is that before we started, we went into the uh, the, the cooking room on the side of me and we, we actually put on a clam boil because we needed some shells for his bag so we brought all the stuff in and while it was while we were working we worked for like an hour and a half to uh, about an hour and then we all chowed down afterwards and kind of talked about what we did it was really great it's delicious uh, yeah it was great <laughs> and then it made its way to Ballard Park it was set up and before the Ballard Park had uh, even opened it got a ton of press, like Mikey said. Yep. It was on the front pages of two of the local papers and on a Saturday. It was on uh, the Channel 10 Nightly News, also on uh, their website. Everyone literally loved Quahog Man because it's so like relatable to where we live. <laughs> and it, I can't believe how much like press it got on like, Twitter. It was seen by 1,500 people. It got like 
750 uh, shares on Twitter, a ton of like likes and favorites. They're just really popular. Yeah. So that's basically what we were asked to talk about. But um, And that was the project. It was a ton of fun. And then I just said, well, we have a second, and we'll make this very quick. With the same group that we've been meeting with, and there's a few more of us that have been meeting, we did a bunch of other really cool projects over the last five months. So we just figured we'd give you a, uh, a look at them quickly. We designed and painted the sign for the middle school. Um, we designed, painted, and made a sign for the technology and engineering department for the boat show. Uh, we painted a few signs for the local driving school on Fish Road. Uh, we have a uh, art display, traveling art display, that kind of goes around the high school and kind of fills in some of the hallways. Uh, and then recently we just put up a history mural in the uh, history mm -hmm. department. And uh, yeah, and that's it. <laughs> but and, and actually with all these things with all these things uh, we just wanted to actually thank you guys because we know that we have a ton of support from everybody um, for these opportunities and you guys find the funding for us to do it and really we think it's great that the middle school says sure you guys can paint it and put it up and we think it's awesome that the administration at the high school says yeah we have enough uh, you know we, we support you guys to put up a mural in the history department and uh, we really appreciate that And I have to thank you guys because um, when we went down to Ballard Park, it was so beautiful, all the lights, and it was a beautiful night. And right next to Kohag Man, there was a beautiful Eiffel Tower. And all the families were coming up, and the mothers were saying, oh, come on, honey, let's have your picture taken in front of Eiffel Tower. And the fathers were going, are you kidding me? Look at Kohag Man. <laughs> <laughs> so we were a huge hit in Newport, and thank you. And, thank and you. he's also making his debut at the Town Hall. He'll be there Sunday for the uh, new artists that are Giving, showing their work, and they're going to take him over tomorrow, and then he'll be there for the Sunday for the um, reception. The Kohag man's going to be there. So, so they said, can we have him for the month? I said, absolutely not. He's booked solid. He has an agent and everything, so he can't <laughs> stay for the month. So really, we appreciate everything you do. Thank you. Thanks, well, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Mr. Weir, the middle school? I'll turn it over to Mrs. Mitchell. A great segue. Um, Mrs. Marshall and I are teaming, Mrs. Marshall here, to come up with some really good snacks for art and tech ed for all that you've done for us. We heard, yeah, we're waiting. Yeah, we're waiting. <laughs> <laughs> they will be helping. Um, and they are on the middle school. March is Youth Art Month, and once again, our Tuberton Middle School artists are participating in Newport Gallery Night. We have 10 of our artists' works that will be on display at the Newport Art Museum, Holman Center for Creative Studies, in the Gilbert S. Kahn building. And we have invitations that we sent to the parents that we also want to give to all of you. Our um, students who, whose work has been chosen for this wonderful, wonderful month-long celebration of uh, art in schools, we have Mackenzie Kyler, grade five, Ella Schneider, grade six, Taylor Williams, grade seven, Izzy Road, Ron Lane, grade seven, Tyler Sylvia, grade eight, Hope Sherman, grade eight, Charlie Brixall, grade seven, uh, Asha Tabor, grade six, Jameson Peckham, grade five, and Brianna Aguiar, grade five. We also had our Patriot Wax Museum a few weeks ago, our second annual, uh, and our founding fathers and mothers were represented there. And so Mrs. Costa wanted to be here. Uh, as she is a mother to have three boys. And so she not only is a great math and social studies teacher and the organizer of our Patriot Wax Museum, she is a basketball mom. So she is going to join us in about 10 or 20 minutes after her son's playoff game. Uh, and she may bring one of our founding fathers. Oh, good. That would be nice. And they may bring costumes. That's good. It was, it was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Elementary, Mr. Rivett? Um, I believe, uh, Mr. Cabral, do you have anything for us? Yeah, on, the, on the elementary level, uh, we wanted to recognize the educators of the year. The uh, Tivin Lions Club is hosting this uh, Tivin Community Recognition Night. It's going to be held on March 28th uh, at Whites of Westport. There were three educators selected, one for each level. At the high school was William Phillips. At the middle school was Christine Costa. And at the, at the elementary, representing all the elementary schools, uh, was Joe, uh, Susan Petrock. We look, just wanted to congratulate, uh, no one thank the Lions Club for offering such an opportunity and, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, 
thank the uh, Lions Go for Honoring Our Teachers. There are also tickets available. I passed out a, a flyer. Yeah. There are tickets available at Ranger if anyone's just interested in attending the March 28th ceremony. Thank you. Also, uh, Mrs. Wardell uh, has some new information that just came in. So, Suzette, you want to talk to the committee? Um, I just received a phone call today that North Barton School was nominated by the Rhode Island Department of Education um, as a National Blue Ribbon School. And we were one of three schools in the state of Rhode Island that they nominated. And um, we are going to apply as an exemplary high performing school. So um, I'd like your permission to complete all of the applications. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, of course. Thank you so much. That's wonderful that's, that's news. That's terrific. Thank you. Okay. The next one. Yes, uh, Dee, I, I've been talking to our, my administrators for a while, and we talked about, we've been talking about technology and how we use it and moving forward as a district, what role it will play with us. Um, so this next item is in two parts. The first, uh, Ms. Santa asked Diane to uh, develop a, a relatively brief PowerPoint as far as how digital learning and the Common Core and Park kind of come together. And then uh, after that, we have teachers from every school who will give very brief uh, demonstrations of things, how to use smart boards, uh, document cameras, and so on, things that we're actually doing currently in the school. So I think it's, it kind of goes also along with spotlight on success so i'll ask diane to, to start with her part of the presentation thank you uh, we're just going to share some information on what the technology skills expectations are for students uh, not only for common core uh, for the park assessment but also for 21st century learning and for their careers in college or going into the workplace um, and then at the conclusion, as Mr. Eric said, we have some teachers who will be presenting. And uh, I want to thank the teachers for being here and for really taking the lead in technology in their buildings. So I'll start by just reviewing the components of PARC. We know that there are two um, portions of the assessment. One will be given in March, and that's the performance-based assessment. And that's more constructive response type of questions. And then at the end of the year, um, the assessment is more like a multiple choice type of test and it's, they, uh, both components will be taken online when the assessment is up and running. <coughs> there are different types of test items on, uh, for the online testing. Um, for the reading assessment, students will be asked to summarize and synthesize information from several sources, including online reading, video clips, charts, and graphs. And the math assessment will include an online calculator for grades 6 through 12, and an online graphing and geometry tool as well that they'll be required to use. And the, this is a listing of the types of skills that students will need to be able to do, and they are embedded within the Common Core Standards. They are also uh, represented in the National Technology student for stu uh, Standards for Students, and necessary within many career fields. And at the district level, with the administrators and with teachers as well, we've all been discussing how we will teach all of these skills, how will we embed them into our curriculum, um, at what grades will they be taught, and then how will they be supported across content areas. This is an example of one of the test item samples. In this reading item, students will select, drag, and drop the stages of the life cycle of a butterfly and collect sequence. And this question um, goes along with an informational article that they would read and then demonstrate the comprehension by being able, being able to put things in the correct sequence. In this item, students read a passage and then answer the question in part A. They then have to show two sentences that support their answer and drag and drop them into the blue boxes. And this question uh, really reflects the emphasis within Common Core for students being able to cite evidence to justify their answers. In this question, students will uh, solve a math word problem and then explain how they got their answer by writing inside of a text box 
using words, numbers, and math symbols. Here's another example from grade seven. And to answer this math problem, students will have to drag and drop the object names in order from greatest to least speed. And then in grade 10, students will be asked to manipulate an online graph using the green arrows that are shown there um, to be able to find their answer. So lots of different tools and techniques that they'll be asked to use. The online assessment also offers many technology-based supports that are not available through a paper and pencil test, and those are some of them listed there. The assessment also offers features that are available to all students, such as a highlighter tool, having words or directions read aloud, a spell checker, a glossary, as well as cutting and pasting tools to edit the writing. Beyond that, there are also some features that are available just for students with IEPs, individual education plans, or 504 plans. So when we think about digital learning in general, um, there are examples of technology within every subject area. So in the area of English language arts, um, it, again, it's within the Common Core standards, it's within any online reading that students will be doing in their future. And it's more than just keyboarding. Students um, are both consumers and producers of information within their English language arts classes. And also accessing a variety of resources. And the digital tools really allow for more engaging and interactive methods of teaching. When we think about digital learning and math and science, there are a lot of online activities, problem solving, online collaboration that students will be engaged with. And there's some, a few other examples. And all of this also connects with the, the, the term STEM and STEAM that we've been hearing a lot about lately. And um, STEAM is science technology, including both industrial and informational, engineering, arts and mathematics, and it's the integration of those subject areas. It's not teaching them in isolation, it's the integration. And within each content area as well, they have their own set of specific standards that have technology referenced. So when we think about technology learning, it's not just in a separate class, it's embedded throughout the curriculum in every content area. long journey ahead of us to be able to provide our students with these experiences. I put together this slide as sort of getting from here to there and thinking about what we would need to um, provide these opportunities for our students. And professional development is really at the top of the list. Um, and as you'll see in a minute, we have many teachers that are ready to move forward, not just for the sake of testing, but to better engage students in the learning that's relevant to the 21st century and to the skills that they'll need for their future. Um, we, we, there are a lot of resources that we need to be able to get there to update our equipment and our teaching. And the technology that we do have today is being used, but there's not enough of it to go around. So teachers have not had the opportunity to really embed it into their instruction and to make sure that every student has access to technology learning. So I'm happy to introduce some of the teachers and they can share some of the tools that they've been using. I know that um, Mrs. Mitchell has an example. Can we just, I'm sorry, could we just go right down the line, high school, sure. middle school? Yeah, okay. Um, so Eric and Stacy, would you like to start? Uh, good evening, everyone. This, this is Mark. Mark's high school. Class of 85. <laughs> nice to see you. Back when I first started my journey here at Tiburon High School in the early 80s, uh, the technology of the day was the mimeograph and the film strip. Mm -hmm. We have come a long way, I think, but there's still room for growth. Uh, just in the social studies department, quickly, 
obviously the, the main way we incorporate technology is through research. And we uh, use the labs here quite frequently to do that. Other things, moving from film strips to streaming video is certainly um, a great addition as well. We can use small clips to, to build interest at the beginning. We can quarter the classes. We know what attention spans are with all people, not alone students. So we can get their attention from, from current things, not film strips or old videos. So that's helpful. Um, beyond that, in certain classrooms, we incorporate video projects. I know one's wrapping up about the uh, Roaring Twenties. They're doing a newscast, which I don't believe they had the technology to do such in the Roaring Twenties, but we bend the rules sometimes. Um, one of the more exciting things lately, we've been dabbling in the iPad. Um, we have a couple floating around the building. Thanks to Linda and uh, the parent groups, we've got a couple in. Uh, I'm trying to incorporate, currently, my SLO with writing. And we're using something called an App Smash, which was a uh, conference that Diane sent me earlier in the year. But a lot of the tutorials were online, so I've just been messing around with that. And this isn't much of a thing to show, but I'll do it quickly. But my goal is to um, use video layering to use green screen, apps that movies use, um, iMovie, and avatar type things. This is me as an avatar, believe it or not. Can the committee just take a look at your avatar there? Oh, sure. <laughs> it's very lifelike. Tell That's awesome. Tell me more. <laughs> 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 oh. <laughs> It'll be a longer project. But the goal will be to do a writing lesson to, to show that you know we've got our base scores for their writing, um, introduce some new articles after seeing this kind of video. And obviously, we're hoping that they'll raise, which I think they will. So questions? ideally, we'd, we'd like to have class sets of tablets so that students... You know, I think ideally that makes sense in a lot of ways, um, definitely. I have people on my staff that are very in tune with this, um, and others that I think are a little hesitant, but if I think if it was everywhere, it would, it would permeate the school. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. That one I passed around is from uh, an app last year, and it's just a comic book thing, but we did a field trip locally about uh, the environment, and we took pictures on the iPad, and then kids wrote a script about the day and put in balloons and it's it's fun. It's, yeah. It's, it's simple but it, it's nice. I think it's meaningful. Yeah, it is. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Stacy Elkins, our science department chair. We'll speak next. Let's play the gloves and the uh, head here, I promise. Uh, so I was asked to talk a little bit about how we use science, uh, excuse me, technology in the science classroom. Um, so I don't want to steal the thunder. I know we changed um, order a little bit. So we're going to use LCD projectors and we do have one smart board in science. So we use those for daily PowerPoint presentations, adding in video clips. Um, instead of actually having to buy videos now, we can find a lot of them on YouTube or free streaming on Netflix, which we incorporate from time to time. Um, online interactive labs, something called Brown Arise, which I know you guys have been exposed to before that we're in a partnership with, so I'll speak on that. Um, our physics lab equipment, and also I will briefly talk about the document camera briefly, so I won't steal your thunder. Um, as far as the online interactive labs, when you're talking about physical science, you're talking about chemistry, I mean, you're talking about molecules bouncing off one another. They're very abstract concepts and they're difficult for students to understand. So there are a couple different online labs that we use just to help students visualize and conceptualize what we're doing. Um, we currently do them in the computer labs around the building. Um, just for some quick ideas on what I mean by that. For physical science, we currently use an earthquake triangulation online lab. So they can actually take real-time data about earthquakes. They can use that to not only triangulate or figure out exactly where the epicenter was, but they can also measure the different P and S waves. They learn about different waves in physical science, the timing it takes for them to reach there. So they can also graphically read that and interpret that information. Um, RII test was an initiative a couple years ago that four science teachers took part in. Basically, it's called the molecular workbench that we work to help create and then also to improve upon. It allows us to take a look at molecules as they're moving um, on a molecular level, excuse me. Um, for instance, this one right here allows students to manipulate both oxygen and carbon dioxide to illustrate the principles of um, osmosis and diffusion, and then also apply that idea to red blood cells and the circulatory system. 
Brown Arise, um, we're in a partnership. It's a PD opportunity that both myself and Jason Douglas is doing right now. Um, basically, we can loan out certain equipments from Brown so we can actually get laptops here that we can use that already have the software on it. And there's also some equipment that you can see here. It allows us to measure EEG brain activity. Um, so for instance, Jason ran this last year where he actually had his students attach the electrodes so they could actually see the electrical brain waves. Something I hope to take part in this year is the EKG. So they can hook it up and monitor their heart rate activity. They can take a look at breathing rate and then also some other um, muscle and nerve physiology. <coughs> Two last things I wanted to mention. We have a physics lab upstairs with Mr. Bernardo, Mr. Rick Bernardo. That we currently have seven Apple computers up there. Um, they're maybe about 15 years old, but they're still kicking. Um, but what we have for those is something called Vernier software, and it's the same software that's used in a college setting, so the same labs that they're doing in either prep or honors physics, they're also doing on a college level. It's about 80% of their class labs. Basically what that, equi that equipment allows them to do is they can run real motion labs. So there they have a cart that runs on that track. They can measure the time, the speed, acceleration. And what they can pull up is graphically actually analyze all of that data on the computer screen. So they're already doing that technology integration in the classroom. And last but not least, um, document cameras. You can use them, obviously, to display what you're doing with student work. But you can also do it for 3D items, such as what I'll be doing next week with my anatomy students. Let's see if I can do this correctly. Uh, um, so for instance, my anatomy students are going to be dissecting brains next week. Well, now when you're working with a class of 24, it's really hard to illustrate some of the more um, minute things. So what I like to do for my kids is use a document camera, which we do have one in science, um, to actually go through one by one all the pieces. And when you get to the inside, which I've already caught for you, um, I can kind of work whole group and explain where everything of these, uh, excuse me, where everything is. So for instance, some of these more minute details I can point out on a whole class setting. And what we'll do is, because they get very nervous about their lab practicals, which is the same exact thing um, in a college setting, is we'll actually record this and put it available online for them so they can review and prepare for their tests. That's about it in science. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I apologize the smell if it starts to seep out. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about that. That's why we have the Ziploc. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Judy Moore, and I'm a business teacher here at the high school. My um, purpose tonight is my presentation is going to be on using the smart board and mainly the smart board notebook which are the tools that no matter what grade level the teacher is all the tools work the same and you'll see the presentation I'm going to run tonight um, can be implemented for whatever grade or curriculum area this a teacher wishes the purpose however for my first slide here is twofold um, first of all, if those of you that know that um, Sheila Kaufman and I are co-advisors in Tiverton's Future Business Leaders of America. Well, last week we brought seven students over to Johnson & Wales University for a competition. And last night we went to the awards banquet and our results are we have seven students that placed in the top in their competitions mm -hmm. out of over 280 students competing throughout the Great. state of Rhode Island. Good Secondly, the competitions as they were, the majority of them, and there were over 60 of them, had a technology component to them. So either they were working on web design, computer problem solving, desktop publishing. There were lots and lots of competitions all involving technology. And even those that didn't involve technology, like accounting or business math, all students competed on a computer. So technology is everywhere. They all need it. So I'm going to move on and show you some of the tools um, that I use with a smart board in my room. I'm not going to go through every page with you because I designed a lot of these for an upcoming professional development session. 
So one of the tools that I think is very, very important that all teachers can and should use is a recording tool. This tool allows me to, once I click on the recording button, I get a recorder up on the corner of my screen, and the second I hit the start button, you'll see in a second, the time is gonna start going down. So everything I write on the smart board, if I had a microphone to make it really effective, will, will my voice will be recorded, any move I make on the smart board, I grab a pen tool, so anything I write, anything I circle, I can write correct answers, everything will be recorded, okay? If I want to pause it, because I need to work with a student, I can pause the recording so it just doesn't go on and, you know, somebody's watching something for nothing, work with the student and then go back and continue recording. So think of the possibilities of this. First of all, I can record a lesson and post it on my website, and then if a student is absent, you can refer the student to go ahead and watch the recording of the lesson. Or in a more current educational setting, the flipped classroom model, I could record a lesson by myself even in my room, so I can go through my notes, can back up and re-record things that I wasn't real proficient on send the students home to look at the lesson as their homework and then the next day come in and instead of me developing the same delivering the same lesson six times throughout the day now we just get to work on implementing the lesson another great tool are the pen tools on a smart board Again, these can be used in any class you can think of. Uh, but we have a pen, I love it, it's called a magic pen. So when I go to my pen selection, I can go down to magic pen. Has everybody seen this picture before? Mm -hmm. Right, remember our psychology classes, <laughs> right? Do you see two people? So if I want to focus my kids or anybody on a specific part, I can simply, if I say, let's look at this, the lady's eye, and if I draw a circle, okay, I get a zoom tool. It's actually a, um, a telescope. So I can move it around and say, well, look at this part of the picture. Whoops. Okay. Now come over and let's look at the other eye of the young lady. Or move it wherever you wish. One <laughs> um, another feature though of that tool that's really nice, if you draw a rectangle tool around an item, that just acts as a zoom and then you can zoom it around the picture or whatever. You could be looking at a map wherever you want. Tables, we all work with tables. Um, this, and this is done more for an elementary level, but think of applying this, to, you can apply it to math, science, history, or whatever. So you can, if, once you create a table, which is very simple, you just click and drag a table. If I said to a student, okay, what is a fruit and what's a vegetable? They can grab it and drag it. Oh, selection tool, you gotta remember to go back to the selection tool. You can click and drag, and whatever square you want it to settle in, it'll actually shrink and fit into that, into that cell. So this is fun. A lot more interactive. I find that even high school students don't want to sit still and just listen. They want to get up and touch and move things around. This is one of my favorites. It's a screen shade. You can have this set up so when students come into a room, you can have the essential question up on the top of your board or and have answers down below. Once they think about their answers, you can simply grab the screen, the shade, and move it down. You can also set up shell, cell shades, which works simply the same way. And you can say what number comes next in the sequence. 
okay, and just tap those through or cover them back up. And this one here, we only have a couple more to go here. Um, this is called Rub and Reveal. Again, it, it's about getting the kids, I think, really involved, getting them interacted with the projects. So here we have a map. What I have done previously to set this up, I actually have an answer hidden below here. So a student can come up and I would say, what state is this? And if they write on it, if they say New York, then we can say, okay, let's take the eraser tool and see how you did. Grab the eraser, and it reveals the correct answer. Okay. Again, getting, getting people interactive with the board. Um, object animation. I could put this out there, say, which of the following chords is not a flat chord? And to make it fun, kids could come up, whoever, point, no, oh, that's not it. And when they get the right one, it's supposed to spin. <laughs> they did it at home. It will do it later. <laughs> okay. And lastly, and I think this is really great, is the, um, the gallery. And this is updated. It's like a live update almost every time or a few times you, you log on to your computer. Um, you'll see it'll, it'll be updating the smart notebook. And that's over on the side tabs here. So when you open this gallery, for every content area here, you'll get corresponding um, either pictures on here. Right now in this smart board, we have 5,236 pictures, almost 400 interactive and multimedia tools to work with, um, notebook file pages, and just some like pretty background themes if you wanted to get this background looking really fun. So if, for example, I went on to gallery, and if I wanted, uh, if I wanted to do a science lesson, I'll and I wanted to do biology, I'm beating off Miss Elkins, you know, I do the human body. <laughs> and now down here, I have interactive and multimedia. We have pictures too, but let's see what we have. All right, I'm gonna add a new page so I have a blank screen to work with. And I don't know if I have a brain space in this. I have hearts. I don't know if they have. I got hearts upstairs. We can do hearts. We have hearts? We have hearts. Structure of the heart? Beautiful. So I drag that out. It usually takes a second to, to focus. While that's getting in focus, what would be great for that in science, and we do have one of these smart boards upstairs, is the fact that in anatomy at least we actually trace a drop of blood all the way through the heart so they could actually try to sequence it and figure it out themselves interactive on the smart board. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now here we go. So we have click and reveal, we have drag and drop. Um, I don't I've never done this lesson, but click and reveal. I don't know how this how you play this game. But they <laughs> are well, I'll figure it out. <laughs> but they all are. I mean they have so so many and I'm not a science person. Um, but there are a lot of really fun activities to work with. Maybe it's that. No. Judy, do all these come with the like how do you get those? Do you are you personally Smart notebook? separate from the right? Do those no. all come? Okay. I added I downloaded this on my home computer a couple weeks ago. I just went on to Smart Notebook, downloaded it free, so that way I was building okay. I built this whole present most of this presentation at home. Okay. So I don't I don't have a smart notebook, so I had to do everything by mouse. I don't have a smart board. Okay. The smart board people okay. share lessons and it's one of those they're, they're free. They're free. Thank you for a great equipment's expensive, but the Right, the I know, really. Yeah. Um so then we have, um, I know Mr. Mario will probably like this one, maybe not. Okay, so, he, <laughs> so he, um, coach basketball, so he, coach bas I look at basketball, I want pictures. I know I saw a field.
anyway, I can't find it now, but there is a picture somewhere that you can put up like a whole basketball court, then you could make your plays, do your little X's, have them pass the ball around or whatever. Um, but I just can't see, unless it's just not updated on this one. But that is smart nice. word. And I'm sure there's a ton more you can do with it too, but I think that's a lot. Okay. Thank you. And congratulations on that award, those, those students. The, the students' awards, amazing. they did really great. Amazing. I was really proud of them. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Judy. I'm Brian Goodwin, I'm a fourth grade special education teacher at Ranger. I'm Kirsten Blanchett, I'm the fourth grade teacher. And we're just going to add a little bit to the SMART uh, board. Um, Judy did a great job explaining how it works. This is how we use it in our class on a daily basis. Uh, this website here is part of our uh, math curriculum. That come, this uh, website comes with our book. And the, it has the actual lesson inside it, and it also has uh, some lessons come with a video, an interactive video. So this helps the students get out of their seats. Um, it's not us up there talking the entire time. Uh, they get to watch a video that's, uh, they're animated, so if for them it's enjoyable to watch, and they can also get out of their seats and interact with the video. This uh, is part of our... Judy broke it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh -huh. This is a recent video that we use um, on fractions, and if we can... I mean, I can... Get it to... It's going to defeat the purpose of... Um, but again, see, it's, a, it's an animated video that the students are much uh, engaged in. So... Hey, how's it going? It's me. They enjoy well, the voices quite a bit. As, <laughs> as do we. Um, and as the video moves along, it, it will pop up with fractions, and the students will have to match up equivalent <laughs> fractions. They can get out of their seats. And as they, as they go. The smart board function of this is not working. <laughs> so so in the video will explain to them what it is they would like them to do. And then we can have a student come up and typically drag a fraction to where it will where it should be. So they would just pull it, so this one's two-fourths and that one's one-half, and they can actually come up and pull it. And, um, you know, I usually alternate kids, and they'll just come up, drag it, and then um, sometimes it'll say done, so that they have time to get to the board and to, you know, think about it a little bit and then, and then do what they want to do. Um, uh, so this is just an example for math. We use it in other subjects as well, spelling, um, things like that, that, where the students can come up. It's also uh, helpful so that you you can you don't have to manipulate the computer from your seat. You can be up in front of the class, move the board, um, not just using dragging things for the students. You know, like we can use anything that we need. We can pull up websites from the class, move without sitting at our desks. We can highlight text. Sometimes we do that, and the kids can actually come up and they can highlight things. And um, it's also really good for in the smart notebook. We can you know do a lesson, write notes, show a way to do it, save it. Um, when we do this again tomorrow, I can pull it back up and say, remember when we did this? And we taught we can go through it again. Um, so it's really good at saving instead of having, you know, to t I, I know colleagues have taken pictures of things that they've done on the board because you have to erase it to do your next lesson. So it's really good so that you can save and, you know, revisit things that you've already done. So. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Hallie Azevedo and I teach third grade at Fort Barton and Beth is our remedial reading teacher and I've highlighted some things that I do using technology in the classroom but not everything mostly I can show you using the Elmo that's how I pretty much start my day so, right. <laughs> where's the clicker? Well, it's, it's um, on, but it's not. There we go. Thank you. It's not my classroom, so I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so, I usually start my day with morning work every day, actually, except for Fridays. 
And one thing I do is a daily review, it's all common core aligned. This particular activity, the children do as soon as they come into the classroom, and that's what they're working on, three different types of sheets. And then when we go over it, I'll put it under the Elmo. What the children love the best about it is they can come up. I call someone randomly. Everybody wants to do it, so it works out better with popsicle sticks. And I'll have a student teacher come up and they go over this with the classroom while I'm walking around the room taking notes. So that way I can see where the students are at that moment, how their grading is going, and making sure the work was also completed as well. So that's important. And so this is my language. This is a reading daily review that we do. And then there's an assessment that goes along with this on Friday. And we also do, we, you know, we're aligning with Common Core and sometimes you get things that don't work. So like I, we started to notice these boxes were really small. So I went back to the everyday math boxes and so they would get a sheet like this and then I just X out the things that don't apply right now to what I'm teaching. And sometimes I fill them in and make some of these bigger. But it's nice and they get to come up and be a student teacher and take turns. Um, that's one way I use the LCD. Another thing is, oh, I should probably go through my paper. So that's morning work. That usually takes about 20 minutes total, you, 15 to 20 minutes of my day to just go over that work. The children are grading. Children are also able to play student teacher and at that time I'm able to walk around and take copious notes on student learning. So it frees me up and they enjoy it a lot, quite a bit. Um, I do almost all my lessons on the Elmo and I love it because I can turn it and face the classroom. Whereas with the old overhead, your back was toward the class and you'd be writing like this. I can turn this any way that I need to and then I can see all the students and we can talk and I'm looking up and, and working with them. Um, I'll put this under as I go through it. So other ways that I use the technology is I'll use the Elmo for brainstorming, summarizing, creating rubrics that I can keep, again, just like everybody else, copy off if I need to or I sit at my computer. I don't have a smart board, but I sit at the computer, which also faces the classroom, and we brainstorm that way, and I type everything, and then I can print that off. Uh, I use the laptops pretty much every two weeks. I use them for word processing. The students use them, not me. And they've gotten really good at maintaining them, how to carry them. Al had come in and so did Greg in the past and taught our students how to use them, how to treat them correctly and they're much better at problem solving when there's a problem on the computer than I am so I don't really do much except walk around and check, make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing and they work together if something comes up and they need to learn to highlight or whatever with the word processing. So we do research we're going to be testing on them, so we'll probably practice on them. I've created PowerPoints. Last year I did something that was really interesting that they use at, co at the college level. My daughter, who's in college, told me about it, and you could join for free, called Prezi's, and it's, it's like a PowerPoint, but it's more interactive. All of my students created Prezi's, and then we saved them, and they sat at the the teacher desk and went through the Prezi presentation for the classroom and that was a lot of fun and it was a great research project because they had to research and fill in all that information as well. Always during snack time I let them, let them, they do whether I let them or not, have some quiet time and talk. But then I will put in some short videos usually. One of my favorites is Smart Songs. They do rap songs to, like right now, one we just went through for a couple weeks was The President. So you could come in my room and they would probably be able to do, tell you all the presidents from Washington down to Obama. 
I do schoolhouse rock videos for multiplication. I also use the teacher toolbox that is the interactive with the um, Ready Common Core resource that we're using right now. I don't have the smart board, so I see what you're saying because you have to sit at the desk and they want to interact with it more, but that's okay. They have that opportunity. I go on IXL, we'll do questions, Common Core questions, and learn during snack. And, it, and they ask to do this. I don't, I'll say, what do you want to do today? Do you want to do um, a wrap or do you want to do the IXL? So we just see what we feel like doing. I go and learn Zillion with any lessons that go along with what I've just taught. They have Common Core lessons online that are really well constructed. So I'll put that in there very short, shorter than the way I talk. So I think that's good. It kind of um, is like, I'm not <coughs> lying to you. This person actually teaches the same way I do. And I think that's important. During science, I love to show the Bill Nye science videos. I always um, find a song to go with our science lessons. There's a great teacher, sixth grade teacher out there called Mr. Parr, and he has um, made songs for just about <coughs> every subject in science. Social studies, we show videos. And um, during Power Block, I have them go on either Raz for Kids, which is a reading site. That's during my reading power block, so they rotate around and they can go on the Raz for Kids site, or they go on a site that I've signed them up called Some Dog, which is a math site. And then sometimes during science, I will do something that looks sort of like college work. It, it kind of is. Actually, it is. It's from a college site, and when we're doing conclusions in science, I will ask questions, and together we construct this final analysis of our science lessons. And so this is one that we just did the other day. They basically write it. They know exactly what I'm looking for. And then I type, I type 80 words per minute, so it's not slow, very quick to do it. And I think we did this in about, 20 minutes. And for spelling, I like to use the Elmo to underline the different words that we're focusing on that week, the different word in different colors. And that's what's nice about an Elmo versus the overhead is it's in color. So they can see exactly what's beneath them. And again, I love the laptops. I have I, a student for instance, many students, a few students over the years, that really struggle with their handwriting. And we do a special events journal, so they write in this often. And they can e have the choice to either type it on a laptop, some of them will choose that and some will not. Some li love to write in cursive and have neat cursive. But I find that the ones that do use the laptops write more and more and more, very much more quickly than the other ones. And they get um, quite adept at re revising their work and learning spell check. So I find that I do get better writing. So here's, I'm moving forward as we go. This is a recent, so you can see the progression there. And here's, one that's very good. I don't think we would have gotten this much if we hand wrote this story. But this is a tall <coughs> tail that was typed in and then we created a body around that. And this one I did last week and Lisa, I sent them home, but Lisa Hill ha is working on the mouse, so she had has the kids typing a story and doing artwork around it. So we're always using the computer. And thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And now it's best turn. Yes. You have one laptop. How many laptops? One. We have two laptop cards, yeah. and each one has 15 mm -hmm. in them. Yeah. And then I have four student computers and one teacher computer, which sometimes I will put a student on. I have to clear my so desk you have off. Five in there all the time. Yes. So you have the 
the carts that you can bring in. And the carts we bring in, and we keep those upstairs at Fort Barton. We're finding that we're using them mm -hmm. upstairs okay. all the time, so it's just easier for us to grab them that way. Right. All three elementary schools are set up the same way. Same way? Yes. Have the same time. Like five in yeah. the room and then the cart. Okay. okay. They're I'm great. lucky to have the carts, but mm -hmm. they are getting kind of dated, and I know I'm hearing from some teachers, I don't know if you're running into this too, but the battery life is very short. Yes. Yeah, they, they could use some updating. Um, I know that, you know, Al has been really good about maintaining them every summer. So when we come in, they're pretty good right from the beginning. It's just over the year they, they go because my students do not s store their work on it, which is one thing that I try to free up as much data as I can. <coughs> Also, now we have the Wi-Fi that's going to kick mm -hmm. in, so that's going to be a lot better for us because mm -hmm. the Wi-Fi can be tricky in my room. You have to go mm -hmm. to certain spots, so if we're researching for the Prezies, we were finding moving around the room looking for Wi-Fi, and then you'd have 10 kids in one spot. Now I think this is going to, that'll be a good update that was made. Well, you know. and also the equipment is five years old. Yeah. So we're, it, right, we're not here for that. No, right I just now. was curious right. how it works. Oh, no, no I, I mean, know, yeah. how old it is. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. for a later conversation. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, it's still great. We still, know, great. We still have a lot of years in them. Yeah. I will be yeah. very brief. I'm just so happy to have the opportunity to be an advocate for a small group use of technology. I am the reading specialist at Fort Barton, and even though my groups are small, I use technology all the time. In my third and fourth grade groups, I have about eight students, so I don't have enough computers for everybody. And with Common Core and Park, a lot of the big things that they do need to do is a lot of research. And to be able to do that, I need the laptops. Um, another part of my job I feel that's huge is motivation. My kids know they're not the best at reading. They, it's difficult for them. They don't always want to do it. But for things like PowerPoint, I get more inc the incredible work from them. For example, one of the things we did and this is a work in progress. They are not completed, so this is just their rough draft. Is we took multiple sources. Sorry, okay. I shut it down. I was just oh, you did. Okay. No, it's all um, right. You should be in there. It'll be two seconds. I'll be careful. Cool. Just one. We did research projects on the president, um, and we used PowerPoint. And they have to use a lot of the tools that Diane was talking about. That they'll have to have backgrounds. They'll have to be able to import pictures. Um, this student chose to do Harry Truman. Um, they had to be able to have different colors. They have to find their facts. So like I said, um, this is still needs to be edited, but this is more than I probably would have gotten if I had to have them just research and handwrite facts. Um, so that's one example how I'm using technology. Another example is along with the motivation, they need evidence for everything nowadays. So I love the Elmo because I can have my students. Chris Van Allsburg is a fourth grade unit that they do, and Chris Van Allsburg has a lot of evidence in it. So what they can do is, for example, the stranger, if they need to say why the stranger is Jack Frost, they could simply find their evidence, come up to the Elmo, and share it with the class. I feel they have more ownership. It's almost like they're presenting. They get very excited about it. Um, so that's another way I use the MO. And last is just with the laptops, not having enough desktops for everybody is um, just typing. In elementary school, that is a skill in itself that they need to learn. And again, just like Hallie said, I get much better quality. You can kind of tell this, I have them highlight their opinion because everybody loves to share their opinion and I want it to stand out because your opinions really should matter. And then their evidence from it. Um, so like I said, even in a small group setting, technology is extremely important, not only for the skills they're going to need, but also just for pure motivation to do their best with reading. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I would love a smartboard in my room. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> we can move on if it's...
uses a documented camera, as do many teachers in our building. Learn Zillion. And a listening station mm -hmm. in Belkin. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Kids love it. Uh, with the document camera. Is that a real thermometer? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a real time? That's what it feels like. Kristen did change a lot of this as well. Stealthix is here. And geometry. You can throw a 3D object, obviously. And remote access is wonderful. It allows accessibility to monitor student work while projection usage occurs. You can walk around the room. Change the image to a black screen to stop the display and focus on the teacher. Picture in a picture allows a uh, model work to stay on the display while others compare their work to it. Cool things. She's also incorporated uh, Learn Zillion, as many of our teachers have. And these are individualized tutorials of math concepts, very quick. And the kids can get in and out and practice. She has a small lab within her classroom. <coughs> One day I walked in and saw a bunch of kids sitting around this little uh, Belkin. The Belkin Rockstar connects up to five pairs of headphones or earbuds. The kids bring their own. Students connect their own listening devices to the Belkin. It's hygienic. And video tutorials of math concepts are played for small groups who rotate in to listen and learn and practice skills. Uh, really cool beans. That's a snapshot yeah, nice. just one day uh -huh. in the life of a sixth grade man. Document camera, online mm -hmm. um, resources, and that funky little Belkin, which uh, really does the trick. That's it, right? Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yep. Is that it, Diane? That's thank it. you very much. Mr. Eric, anything? No, I think the I thought that was wonderful. Yep. Very good information. Can we? Uh, can I make a motion to move up 6F, only because I'm not sure how much longer I can stay? 6F? Second. Second. Yep. Okay. Six. All those in favor? Uh, only because this is quick. Um, 6F? That, yeah. That's a chart of account. Chart of yeah, because we just wanted to set a right. date. Oh, oh That's right. all that was. Okay. We're not actually going to look at it. We just wanted to set a date for a, a workshop. Okay. So I wanted so to all see all those in favor, yes, we voted for that to yep. move it up. Thank you. I just wanted to see what people were thinking. Because I, I think we said if we wait until September, if we wait until September, it's going to be too late because then we're already doing the budget. So to really dig into this and really understand what we're spending on a pu per pupil basis, we really need to have some workshops. So what do people prefer? Saturdays, the Tuesday nights we're not meeting. Tuesday nights we're not meeting. I mean, we don't probably May yeah. start in maybe May. Yeah, it's something that we. It's really just for our. For right, us it's to, just for us yeah, to start to, to, to planning to, to, to for, get a yeah. better understanding. Also, really, essentially, to lay the groundwork for the budget for next. Right. Year. Yeah. Um, actually, personally, Wednesday or Thursday night would be a more likely night for me. All right. So, um, why don't we? Why don't I send out some dates? Send out yeah, some dates. Yeah, why don't you say Wednesday or Thursday night dates in May? Starting in mid May. Mid May. After the mid -May. Town meeting. After, yes. the, after yeah. the meeting. After the vote. After the FTR. FTR. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> you can come. <laughs> Bring some yeah, throw out some dates and we'll see. Yeah, and just see what everyone can See do. if we can get a majority okay. at a couple of workshops. Okay, okay, thank you. That was it. That's, that's good. Thank you. So that's done. Do you want to do the does the committee want to do 5B first or 5A? If Deb's on a tight time Deb, what line. do you want to do? If you have to leave? A. Okay. Mr. Barrett? Yeah, this item, this? again, uh, we uh, discussed it at great length at our last meeting. Um, and the committee concurred that 
uh, they won't, it might be a good idea yeah. to take some time to think about what everyone was saying uh, regarding the park field test, which is scheduled uh, to take place this spring. And again, just for folks at home, this doesn't, we weren't talking about the following year. No. The park is mandated. We're, we're talking strictly about the field test question, which uh, is this tentatively scheduled for this spring. I have one question. What if so parents can opt out? So when we go ahead for a go plan, is that say we do go ahead with the, the field test and parents opt out, are there gonna be substitutes hired? They're gonna be told to stay home, they're gonna join another class or uh, we would if the committee did approve it, we would I would meet with the principals and we would come up, you know, with a plan to so the kids wouldn't miss time. In other words, we just wouldn't let them sit there and you know, read a book or something. They'd be doing work, you know, for the class. They may be combined with another class, depending on the numbers and stuff. But we would try to obviously avoid the cost of hiring substitutes. But do don't like we that. have like if if um, even if you have like regular tests and a kid who was out and wasn't prepared to take that test, we would we have alternate things we do for those kids yes. too so and it's not just, unlike yeah we would just do it at a great at a bigger you know expand that right it could be maybe half I don't even know what the number would be but, right you know I unless mean, we got a real large opt-out number you know that might change a little bit but right. we wouldn't know until we get them until we you know if the committee made that decision I think it will be also extremely well, important and on our part honest to simply explain what this opting out means. It means that your child will be taking this test when it really counts for the first time for real without an opportunity to try. Well, the, and the, so that's that's good for a parent. We have to we have to honest listen to <coughs> indicate otherwise someone says, well, it's something which uh, well, it's not necessary, let's opt out of this. Well, I went on the park website and they made it very clear um, that students schools uh, that do not participate in the field testing will not be at a disadvantage um, and they had it's part of their frequently asked questions and and I've written it down they assure um, everyone that park will provide all schools with practice tests in spring 2014 the practice tests will be similar in content to the field tests and allow all schools to become familiar with administering computer assessments and with the item types, interactive item functionalities, and computer-delivered accessibility features and accommodations that will be on the operational assessments in 2014-2015. And uh, as we discussed last time, um, teachers uh, will certainly be preparing all of their students um, through the use of these practice tests as opposed to the isolated classes which will get um, exposure to the field tests and I think it's also important to let parents know that when students participate in field tests there is no they get no feedback so it's like shooting at a darts at a dartboard in a dark room you have no idea if you came near it or not but you just keep throwing whereas in the spring when all students are practicing with their teacher uh, they will get that feedback if they don't understand something it will be clarified for them if they've taken the wrong approach that correction will be made so uh, it will be much more meaningful and helpful with the feedback than it can be when you're shooting in the dark why, why don't we do two things why don't we take a vote on whether we are going to opt out or not opt out and then let's go on to the second issue of if we're not how we want to word a letter so um, I'll, I'm gonna make a motion um, I, I do want to say that it does give me great pause when the superintendent recommends something that and I'm coming to a different conclusion because I do respect his um, his opinion and his advice um, so I did sort of go through the last two weeks my thought process um, what I what I was thinking um, unfortunately I'm still coming to the same conclusion I think testing especially standardized testing as a nation 
is sort of out of control and where we have an option to choose and remember we're not it's not being mandated by ride it's not being mandated by the federal you know by the feds we're choosing we're choosing to give a standardized test to prepare for a standardized test and I know if I was sitting on that side of the table and not on this, I would want somebody to say no. So um, I'm going to choose to say no, to opt out of these tests and to just let our teachers spend that time teaching. Um, so I'm going to make a motion that the district opt out of the test. I'll second the motion. Any more discussion? Yeah. Okay. Um, so what we are saying is that we will take kids out of the classroom uh, we will not do the teaching but we will prepare them for the tests later but not right now and uh, i understand the notion of uh, you know throwing the darts at least you know what a dart is how it feels in your hand and then you have to throw it and the the aiming and, and aligning things in terms of what kind of questions are going to be asked this is all about the mechanics of the test so it's not scary. What does this mean here? Well, drag and drop. We are talking about preparing kids for all the mechanics of the test. So only only for Barton. Everyone else is yeah, taking I, I a paper test. But at least someone felt it and, and, and could share it with others. But and uh, ten percent of the class, not even sure. all the classes. Sure. About high state testing, as this is part of this discussion. Um, we, we, we have completely different opinions, but high state testing allows us to identify the problems in the system. For example, SAT, uh, AP testing is a high state testing, am I right? Uh, you take it, you either spend the whole year studying the subject and you got one, two, or three, or four, and five. So we have, uh, we have our own evidence about um, how well we are doing in some subjects, and without the high state testing, actually seeing the AP scores, we would, I bet, that some of these teachers who evaluated teaching these courses got very high evaluations. Because let us assume there's the following scenario here. Someone absolutely is qualified to do this. Someone can do a good job, but someone is going to be lazy and it's not going to do it simply with the kids. So now you come and you evaluate the class. What is the teacher going to do? The best performance of his or her life, am I right? So everything is fine. And without this measurement from outside saying 13% of the kids, where in other schools it's 80%, and our school is 13%, without this piece of data, we are okay, am I right? We are doing great. It's an example of high stakes testing. So that's basically a, sum, a tool which identifies the problems. How we are going to use that data in terms of how we are going to decompose this to find the, 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 the cause of, of, of some deficiency which we have, that's a very complicated issue. But we cannot simply say, well, we are not going to measure, we don't want to know this. Don't test me because we might find that there is something wrong. It does not feel good. You are poking me and you are trying to make me feel uncomfortable here because maybe I scored 13 as opposed to 80. Um, <coughs> so that's all I have to say. And um, obviously, everyone knows how I'm going to vote because the whole education system is to put people out of their comfort zone, to put them, to expose them to some high standards, which if everyone is going to meet all the standards all the time, they're all great. And the whole system is about making everyone feel good about themselves as opposed to saying, you know what, it's okay to feel bad and just try to figure out how to get better. Um, to my knowledge, maybe I, I live in a different world than everyone else, but in, in, in my opinion, that's how we advance anything as opposed to saying we are doing great. So we are on this, in this mode is let's not, let's not ask questions because we are going to potentially look bad, or we will see something we don't want to see, etc. That's um, that's my private opinion and <coughs> and view on these issues. And obviously, I will vote along these lines, no matter what anyone says. Okay, John. Yeah, I'm okay. good. Um, so, uh, 
you know, I remain deeply ambivalent about this. I, I, I do believe with the high stakes testing, we're sort of rushing into madness. However, I think that what we need to preserve is parents' uh, ability to opt in if they, in truth, feel that this is going to be of some benefit to their child. Um, I do not believe it is going to be a benefit to the child, but if parents believe that it is, then they should still be allowed to do that, recognizing also that parents um, have the ability to opt out. And along those lines, although my vote, uh, you know, you'll see in a minute, but I probably need to out myself. At home we have a committee of two, and there's only one voting member, and you're not looking at him, so my own child may be opting out. So I think people should know that as they see me vote. Uh, I, I would just like to add that um, for many parents, this is not a decision that they're going to have the, either the information or the time to make for themselves. Um, and so y your point that, well, this will allow parents a chance to opt in, I think the default is that children will be taking the field test unless their parents have the time and the means uh, to educate themselves about the costs and the benefit. Um, and mm, as I said, I think parents count on the school committee and um, the rest of the administration to have these kind of discussions and to take the vote for them. And so with that said, I would say if you as an individual feel that it's not the best use of your own child's time, you should vote your conscience for other people's children as well. Maybe I should clarify. I'm not saying that it, that is my opinion. I'm saying that's why I think things are going to play out at home. And I think okay. it's... That's just full disclosure. Official, I think that people have the right to know that. And that's and just, that's full disclosure, yeah, that's so all it is. We heard it here first. Right. That someone who voted to preserve the yeah, field testing, that's, that's their child opted out. Yeah. Okay, so, I too am ambivalent. Mr. Murray was down back there and he knows I believe in practice. I believe in rehearsals. But as Mrs. Herman said, this isn't for everyone. If this was for every child in the school system to get used to it, I'd say absolutely. But when I do my research, as you can see, it's constant. And I, I, I read the New York Times Magazine that says, the SAT is hated by stressed out students, frustrated educators, hamstrung admissions officers, anxious parents, and all of the above. Now the SAT, the funny thing is, when I went to school and my kids went to school, that was it. You could do whatever you wanted in high school, be on the highest honors, and if you didn't get that certain number, your thing went in the trash. Thank God that doesn't happen anymore. The colleges are finding out that the well-rounded students and the kids that have the day-to-day -day initiative to study and everything are going to make it. So my mother's college that she graduated from in 1938, Regis College opted out of SAT, Salve, a lot of the colleges, you don't need that to get in. They look at that, but it's multiple measures that we talk about all the time at Tiverton High School, how it's multiple pathways, multiple measures, down on the elementary level. You're not a number. You don't walk around the schools. I'm a one, I'm a two, I'm a three, and I'm a four. Adi Duncan himself said it. So when I have to make this decision, if it was for every child in the system, it would be absolutely, I want everyone to have the benefit. But what are we saying? We're going to give the benefit to a few, and the rest of them? Oh no, talk to me about that, talk to me about charter schools, talk to me about fracturing a public school system. That's not what Horace Mann was talking about. It's for every kid that walks through our doors in every school to have every opportunity. So now we're giving some kids an opportunity to learn how to drag, whatever that means. I don't even know what that means, to tell you the truth. But when I look at these things and I said, what is that? What are they talking about? And I'm glad we have teachers here that are going to tell my grandchildren what it's about. But I want them, if they're going to tell Michael, I want them to tell Sam and Ben too, and all the rest of the kids. So this is even crazier than ever. We're giving some kids the opportunity to excel, and we're giving other students that may be excellent, they won't, you won't even know how smart they are, because they won't know what they're doing. 
So I trust Mr. Eric, and I trust Diane, Mrs. Santa, and all you teachers to help all the kids, but I certainly can't support the Department of Education again when they sat over there the other day and told us that there were actually questions on the knee cap test that these students had never had, because you have to have a full year of Algebra one, a full year of geometry, and a full year of Algebra two to do well on that test. And then we're telling kids, oh, don't worry. So I said to someone, I think we should all know ancient Greek. We're going to decree that on the school committee because it's the foundation of civilization and democracy. So let's all take that. And you're all going to come because I took it. And you're going to say, what is that? But don't worry. When you feel, we'll teach it. We'll tutor you. And you're going to feel again, we'll tutor you again. You'll so, show some growth. And what does that mean? It means nothing. So again, this is a flawed system from the Department of Education mandating down to us. I checked with our congressman because David Abbott said, it's not our law. Check with your congressman. Well, I did. It's a law that you have to have a test, but you don't have to take it over and over again. It's not a high stakes exit test. You just have to have a test. And we went from No Child Left Behind, which went from 2001 to 14, and we opted out. And this was a provision we had to take this test now. That's what, what we said we'd do. So No Child Left Behind might have been tough, but it was a good concept. We're leaving a lot of kids behind in this race to the top. So I can't support this. And believe me, I did my homework. I called everyone. I checked with everyone. And I, I just can't support this. So thank you. So, so, Mr. Rarick, uh, do you have yeah, anything? No, um, I certainly understand everyone's position. I'm, and I, maybe it's my nature, but I'm skeptical. Uh, and I know what Carol read <coughs> off their website, but I'm skeptical that they'll have meaningful <coughs> practice questions. It is spring, you know, 2014. Um, not that that impacts anything, because the question is, do you want them to take this particular test. I'm just saying that I'm skeptical that they will have it because remember the point of taking the test supposedly what they told us is to calibrate questions and develop questions. Well if they're doing that now in the spring of 14 maybe it's just me but I don't understand how you get practice how you'll have a practice test in the spring of 2014 when they haven't done the developed the test yet. So again maybe it's just the way my brain works. That's the only point I wanted to make. I certainly respect and understand position and you know we'll execute whatever the committee wants do any of the an do any of the principals want to say anything about it because we value your judgment nope <laughs> <laughs> no we, we discuss this a, a lot in administrative council meetings and when we, when we work at it we, we always have this work uh, come to the conclusion of all of us so you know, when, when, when he's expressing his opinion, he's also expressing the opinion of all the administrators as a team. I just call the vote. Diane? Diane? No, I agree with everything that's um, been said. The, the only other piece or benefit that wouldn't be realized through teachers just doing some of the sample items is the whole process of administration, um, especially from the online component, us being able to um, check our own capacity, but other, you know, we will have to find another and way unfortunately, to it's, it's only ready. one school and part of the school. It's Although not a school. Software yeah. tools to test the course. Yes, yeah. Park did have that on their website, too, that they would. Oh. And I think we will do okay on the time. But I think when Diane was talking capacity, she wasn't talking a class. It was take that class, learn what is what happens there and then extrapolate out to our entire district mm -hmm. you know that's I believe that's what you mean by yes. capacity it's not do we have the you know software package it's can we if we ever had to go to that can we do it and what would be some of the problems that's someone in the district a colleague went through this experience and say listen that's how it is that's what happened that's what this is about uh, we will not have that experience so you know, and these are people who basically are in the trenches, and they are telling this this, this thing that, from what I hear, it might be a good idea I, that someone is going to try it. But as because uh, we've, and the last thing I'll say is, I think there's a bigger battle ahead. I agree. Uh, regarding park and how it's used for graduation, I agree. and I think 
the committee needs to put this just make a decision yeah. and focus our energies on that because that's really where it's going to matter I mean I think it's important that we've had these conversations it's important but the bigger there's a bigger battle that needs to be waged that we're going to need 100 to, to work agree, together Bill. on so your recommendation would be to to have uh, it? my recommendation still would be to experience it. okay but so I, I certainly mean, understand just again to, I guess make sure my position is clarified I, I do not believe in high stakes testing I do not I don't believe it tells us where the errors I don't are either or the system uh, and um, I agree with Mr. Rerick that this is probably not the time to fight the battle um, and that this will at least allow us to have some knowledge of the test itself and, and when we have to talk to them next year we can say you know we did we did what we you told us to do and we disagree with what's going on now so so, so when I hear Mr. Rerick say he speaks for the, our principles I hear Mr. Cabral say the same thing then I have to defer to my administration but I hear very different things from parents and from our teachers last week so I, I mean it's I, it's a tough it's a tough it's one. a hard decision and we certainly understand our position and I like Sally if everyone was doing it I think yeah, it would our, be different but where you're our only dynamic is, our job is to provide the committee right. with right. as much information right. as right. possible and there are going to and I've always said whenever we disagree about educational issues that's fine because mm -hmm. we're discussing what's best for kids and there are times where you know the idea doesn't carry this I mean I again I just want us the, the committee to vote and move on regardless, right because I, regardless I agree we have, a big, we have bigger is. issues it's just bigger and um, I don't want us to waste important right. human capital political capital on this question so I would you know I have no problem when if the committee decide if the, the vote went not to do it I don't you just want to vote we will <laughs> we'll execute it we'll do whatever the committee we serve at the pleasure of the committee we'll execute and the, that's fine that's fair vote. okay all those in favor of opting out opting out all those against so then um, I'd like to make a motion that we send home the letter that we got from ride but mm -hmm. that we modify it to uh, include some language that basically says well the district is um, providing the field test that it is a voluntary test and if the parents choose to opt we'll out to we'll and that highlight that students, parents, we'll add students that. will not receive the scores I think it says that in the letter doesn't scores, it but I think we'll, we can highlight the that they have the right to opt out right and, and that they well, do you want them just to contact their principals yes that would be you? the easiest way to because okay. and, and that will provide other learning yeah. opportunities educational opportunities for those children that opt out and then also put the website up and, and say you know we recommend that you do educate yourself on this question and um, I think that's the best we can do like with any other question so the best we can do is educate so, the so how highlight but that it's it is voluntary although we're choosing it to do it it is voluntary and you want to highlight that there that we will not no the district scores. or the students, students will not be getting any information the district. No. well the the prop the concerns you have yeah and and, and the, and the and number of hours yeah. that they, the students can mm -hmm. expect to spend preparing for the field test and taking so the it's really if you want to know if your ch child is participating you're going to need to contact your principal and then if you want to opt out you're going to need to contact because we'll not everybody's participating right. well we're right. going to send it just to those the ones that are parents so in the oh, class. Okay. it's easy yeah. in That's other easier. words yep just yep. the ones that are going to do the it the class of fort barton Good. their okay. classroom Good. will get the and letter. if they don't want to take it because it doesn't okay. pertain to anybody else it's just okay. easiest for that okay thank you okay Yes, I was. Okay, thank you, everybody. No, we haven't voted. We did. We did. Not to. What? Oh, not to second. Oh, what's the second? Oh, oh. To okay. send out a letter <laughs> for all my letters. Oh, okay. All those in favor? Okay, thank you. We'll get that out the next day or so. Okay, Mr. Beer, on to something budget, else exciting. The budget. Yeah, um, the budget. I just gave you a PowerPoint. This hasn't changed since we last. Um, I didn't bring it to the screen because nothing's changed. What, um, what was in the, the expense increase, Doug? Not without without the increase in revenue, just the flat because they were um, one point nine percent. Okay, that's what I thought. Someone right. asked me, and I said I thought without yeah. any increase in revenue. Right, we're still at you know we're at one we're still nine. At one nine. And the uh, I believe the the question that that came up um, at our last meeting and prior to that when we were doing the budget was the cross country yes. 
uh, stipend. I believe that's really the only open question uh, that we have in the budget. St uh, no, Steve? I don't see Kelly Levesque here, but I did want to. you here for that? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I did uh, want to. Before we do that, yeah. I, I see somebody in Colonial. Oh, Bob. yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't, <laughs> we I don't, don't mean to cut Bob off. We don't want to keep him. I see Martha Washington. How could I miss that? <laughs> I don't know. I just figure. Sorry. Actually, I'm Mercy Otis Warren. Okay. I said Martha Washington. Patriots going to go to bed or That's right. I didn't notice you back there. I don't know how I missed you. Could you? Um, we came to talk to you today to tell you about the Patriot Project that we're doing in our social studies classes at sixth grade, myself along with the four of the social studies teachers. Um, we really took our American History Unit and really brought it to life. Um, along with our textbooks, uh, the students walked the Freedom Trail on our field trip in Boston. Mm -hmm. We also had Revolutionary War reenactors come and visit our school with artifacts. Uh, they passed around even uh, cannonball shells, a uh, musket that does not fire, um, <laughs> and many other artifacts. We also visited Prescott Farm in Middle Middletown, Rhode Island to learn the true history of our very own William Barton. And then students studied patriots who made a difference during the American Revolution. Um, my son studied Sam Adams. His name is Sam also. Um, so he's going to tell you um, about his role. Yes. Could you just turn it so that oh, you sure. see the button? Because when I last oh, yes. year, when I sure. went, I started talking to the students. They and they, would, they wouldn't talk back. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, one of them was kind enough to point to the button. <laughs> And then I would push the button and then they would speak. So I just wanted to see sure. if they hadn't seen The premise it. is to have um, a living wax museum. The students present in class to their peers and then they present to the fifth graders so that way the fifth grade students know what to expect next year when it's their turn. Um, and then we invited um, school committee members, uh, family, friends, relatives, um, and they came down to visit. So visitors would come by and press the button and then the Patriot would go into character and tell you about the difference that he or she made during the revolution. So, you're up. Right. Hello, my name is Samuel Adams and I'm one of the most important Patriot leaders of the American Revolution. I was the fourth of 12 children. I spent most of my childhood watching boats going in and out from Boston Harbor. My first school was the Boston Latin School, then later on I continued to Harvard College. After I graduated, I met a woman named Elizabeth Checkley. We had six children, but sadly she died giving birth to her last child. After I met and married a woman named Elizabeth Wells. Before the revolution, I continued my father's brewing business. Unfortunately, I ran it so badly it had to close. During the war, I persuaded Nutris to join the Patriot side. <coughs> I organized a group of men called the Sons of Liberty. We tried to get tax collectors to resign from their jobs. I created a group of men called the Committees of Correspondence. We sent letters to the colonists explaining what was going on between the colonies and Great Britain. I organized the Boston Tea Party. Members of the Sons of Liberty threw 342 chests of tea into Boston Harbor. And lastly, I was one of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence. I will always be remembered as one of the most important patriot leaders in the American Revolution. Thank you. Wow. Oh. <laughs> 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 a history teacher. It's amazing how detailed and, and wow. how well the, the students research their role and I take it, it very seriously. It was an amazing time. It really Thank is something you. to and see. And a lot of fun. Yeah. And, and, and again, fun. history gets overlooked now because it's ELA and math, so I'm, I love this. That's night. wonderful. Oh, thank you so much, and thank you for coming. The okay. students did have to do their primary source documents mm -hmm. and then secondary yeah, sources. They did a great but, job. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned how history is being overlooked because they made the point the other day about the change in the SAT. Mm -hmm and how they're going to include questions on there related to uh, founding documents. So this Long is overdue. a really good, it's good good time for it to roll back to That's great. So Thank you great. so much. Thanks so much Thank for you. having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Sam. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It's like a senior project six years ago. It really is. I know. It's like a senior project. Just leave the board. <laughs> Eric could use it in one of his music <laughs> classes. <laughs> So, you want a powdered wig, Bob? I'm not made to do that. All right, back to this. To I, the I think our only question was <coughs> um, we me. had agreed to <coughs> add the coach stipend, but we needed parent 
uh, commitment to fundraise for the remaining funds and I, Kelly wasn't here tonight but she did um, make sure she called me and um, uh, I also spoke with a second parent can't remember who it was um, Doreen Phillips oh, yeah. that um, they are uh, while they couldn't be here tonight they are committed to fundraising just like they do at the middle school to make sure that um, they can cover um, the extra costs beyond the stipend. So that was really our big concern. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that, you know, we were going to add it. It was just yeah. that the parents were going to be committed. And that's a very committed group of parents, and I have no doubt that they'll um, rise to the challenge. And I wanted to ask a question because I listened to this. Um, and it was reference to the lacrosse. If I'm not mistaken, I wasn't here, so I want to make sure I'm keeping on correct grounds. Uh, lacrosse fundraised for five years before it yes. became a. Okay, the middle school parents have raised money for four years to prove that this program can be sustained. Does it matter at which level that we raise the money to determine that yes, it is, it is a viable program for us to run? So do we have to go another four years at the high school? Or does it matter where we go? Like, I know that you're gonna ask for a grant to be able to run at the, uh, at the elementary level. We're already, we're already running at the middle school level. Next year, we'll have four years' worth of kids have had an opportunity to participate cross-country, which has been funded by parents fundraising at the middle school level. Why can't we add it at the high school and absorb it as a, as a program without having to do that? The issue, Mr. Murray, is not just athletics. It's district-wide that we have lots of programs that we're not funding okay. or that are being 100% fundraised or that have had their fundraising cut or we're only okay. paying a small stipend. That's fine. So it's not fair to say, let's fund completely Agreed. Agreed. I'm not cross country, a brand new sport, when we're not funding so many other things as a district. It's it's just the, the, next question, the next question I wanted to ask, would you allow me if you give me that coach's salary to creatively fundraise to make sure that I can take care of this, because I've already had something offered to me. I'm probably not going to need a whole lot of help to do this. I've already got someone that's offered me a sum of money to be able to cover this if the school department wasn't going to be able to. We're only covering this. What's the question? Yeah, that's, and that's all I'm interested yeah. in. Is there I would just like to be able to. I would just like to be able to run the program. Okay, if you can provide the stipend for the coach. Oh, you may be able to get funds from the outside? Take, yes. Allow me to take care of that. Well, Please do. We're not used to people saying that. I was like, oh, okay. So that's what the rule is for. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, that's so as long as I know that it can be so that I can stop the process of informing kids that we're going to begin this yeah. in the fall. Right. Pending, again, it's all part of the whole package. Understood. But yes, they that's... It's in the budget. We would take. The oh, stipend. absolutely. Yeah. And oh, if you could do that, we don't care who, who contributes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, that's That'd great. Thank yeah. you. Right. Okay. Thank so you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's the budget again. So nothing changes. We're still at one nine. I had a quick question. Um, the roll forward, Doug. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's in here. The fund balance roll forward. Oh yes. I don't think it's in today's budget. I don't think we put it in this. I well, I'll ask it as part of the budget anyway. Sure. Um, when I was looking at the fund balance roll forward, mm -hmm. we had the facility study in at 50. Didn't that come in a lot lower than that? Yes. Or were you just still had estimates in there? Yeah, until we had a contract sign at that point, I think I was using the original estimate. Oh, so okay. that, so that hasn't been Obviously, you stay in the fund balance because okay. we didn't yes, get it's it. Yes, it's, it's about 30000 if I remember. Mm -hmm. Right. So do we need a motion to send the final budget, or they already have oh, it? Wait a minute, please. First, we have to. Oh, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Oh, Perry. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Hello. I just want to make sure we got the right, the right numbers, Doug. Mm -hmm. sure. um, general fund, you had twenty nine, two forty four, four three five. That's correct. And then under capital, thirty one zero zero four. Correct. So your total would be twenty nine, two seventy five. 439. Yes, so that's correct. So all those numbers stay the same. Yes. yes. Yeah, the only thing pending is if we were going to change anything this evening with cross country, it would have altered that. But no, that's so that, what that was in the budget, 2504. Right. What you received from us is still, the same. still stands. Right. Um, state funding, are those numbers? We had our delegate, uh, our uh, state house delegation in a few weeks ago, and, and they they said the numbers that we had were still the the, the best numbers to use, and those were prov provided through ride in December. So okay. nothing led us to believe that that's well, basically. Change. It's still, still. Been, we've been told the whole you know that number was is still valid as of great. Now. 
I just wanted to thank you for all the hard work that you've all put into this. Well, thank you and, uh, thank for you working with us. And again, as I was telling the new town administrator, I met him and introduced myself. Um, we had a very fortunate year. You know, everything seemed to come together right. And I wish I could say with a great deal of certainty it will be as easy next year, uh, but I don't think it will be. But this year we were able to thankfully get it to, to that number. So. At this time in our lives, we take it one year at a time. Absolutely. <laughs> a year from now is late, you know, long time. Oh, thank you, Mr. Perry. Thank you. And um, just in general, I brought all my charts for you could, to look at for the local funding and the s federal funding and um, the shared service and all the things people might be interested in. Yeah, sure, Mr. Dave, when, would you, when is your date for approval? So if there are any, not the meeting uh, in the auditorium, but... You usually have a meeting in March. Yeah. You put numbers. Um, it's usually the, the second week in March. We don't. We haven't pinned it down yet. Isn't that this week? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> second week in May. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. um, I thought I brought the agenda with me, but apparently. What do you mean? We we have one more. Um, this week we're going through a couple of small departments. And then we start voting for the next four weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you've got at least a month. So the second Thursday in May would be the eighth. Is that correct? You tended to be looking at. Right. Okay. Yes. So is that when you would like us there to? When do, I guess we need to be there when you got to when the when you vote is. on yeah. the school budget. Will you yeah. let so us know so Absolutely. we can be there? We'll let you know. Okay. okay. Fine. Thanks. That's that's all. I need. Yeah, that'll be in within the next four weeks. Okay. Thanks. So, so we already forwarded it to them, so we don't. So know, but I mean we have they to. Vote. No, I know, but do we need anything? We need to else? vote no, tonight. The, well, we need yeah. to vote tonight so to send the final budget, because I have to. Okay. I, I want you to at, please put the resource officer first, so I can go recuse myself. Well, we've already we've already voted on sending the budget. We don't need. Yeah, it. but this is the final vote to send the budget to we the. We need okay. another Maybe. vote. I think Mrs. Black wants one. Yeah, I just okay. Because I want to really accuse myself. So you can do that. All I do is send a letter to Dave saying. Okay. Here's the number. Your phone. But the number hasn't changed. No. It'll be a very brief memo to him. I don't know. What so let's just do the budget in total. We'll just do that. And sure. Just for informational purposes. Yeah. Just for information. Uh, our our full appropriation request is twenty nine million two hundred seventy five thousand four hundred thirty nine dollars. So which will be which will be our number. We would ask the budget committee to present. So yes. I'll make a motion to uh, present a uh, to approve the final budget for a total appropriation of twenty nine million two seventy five four thirty nine. Carol, you want to call the vote? You get that. You're the VP. <laughs> All in favor? <laughs> Carol, you handle that. Uh, Four in favor. Uh, one recused. And uh, I need to go back to work. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Our next. Uh, I don't want this packet. Uh, the next uh, are kneecap scores. No, I'm sorry. Professional Development Day. Um, I I put in the packet. Um, some information uh, regarding because uh, we have a professional development committee that uh, teachers volunteer to stay to serve on to provide us uh, impact or feedback I should say on what professional development opportunities they'd like us to offer and you have uh, a document uh, Diane chairs the committee professional development advisory committee and one of the things after we had our first uh, session because we haven't had PD days as you recall for a long time um, due to budgetary constraints so this year was the first time we started rolling them out um, there was and we you know after we had the first day we, we did the surveys as, as you're aware uh, but we've also talked to the teachers and, and to Amy and Chris about how it went and one of the th main messages we got back was there was a divergent view on the part of teachers as to what PD is or what it should look like in general terms not mm -hmm. so much specific which we have for you so Diane and the, and the uh, committee uh, drafted this document that we think encompasses serves as a good outline to answer those questions and it's not something that will never change I, I view this document as something that will be ongoing 
that the professional development committee and the committee will work together on but it, our, our teachers need to understand you know kind of give them you know what our expectations are um, during the activities uh, a lot of our activities are are meant to engage the, the teachers whether it's curriculum development technology uh, seminars or, or PD that we're, we're providing guidance counselors with um, information uh, regarding way to go RI and, and things of that nature so um, I just wanted to put that in there for informational purposes so you could see it and if you have any questions we certainly can answer any questions and then our, our, our proposal and again came out of that committee um, and I know we originally, as I talked about, how we maybe we talked about maybe 50% of the teachers being involved in the tech, but it came back to me uh, and Diane and the principals, and the principals made it clear that they felt that this was a better, would be a more accurate, uh, more effective uh, menu um, based on where we are as a district. So it's modified a little bit. We do have on the second page, we do have several departments um, participating in the digital learning. Uh, pieces um, and as once we get the common core down uh, where we're comfortable with or in the next year or two obviously we'll be doing more PD around the digital learning but the principles if you want to hear it's up to you I know we're, it's a long meeting but when you hear from the principals as I have and from Diane as to how much the teachers are actually using the, the technology um, at least I've been it's come to me that they, they want more technology they, they want more access to it um, at the different levels and I know it's not tonight's not the night to talk about it but that's a message that we're hearing mm -hmm. you know uh, uh, from the folks that are in the field so um, I would like the committee to uh, just approve the, the menu uh, for PD day on the uh, 21st the 21st of this month. I'm sorry. 21st of this month. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, okay. March 21st. Well, you make the motion. I'll second it, I, and I would just like to add that um, I would like to thank, as as Bill did, all of the teachers uh, and Diane um, who sat on the uh, advisory committee, mm -hmm. and I'm sure spent hours uh, working to ensure that the professional development um, activities that we offer are meaningful for every teacher and um, the fact that uh, we have this chart with so many different a activities planned uh, shows me that it it is um, highly personalized and so will be relevant and helpful to teachers because I know that one size does not fit all and that often leads um, to discipline pointing professional development activities because um, if it's just one or two it, it can't be meaningful for every educator in the building um, so thank you for the work and that was a lot of hard work thank you all those in favor okay and I do want to point out again um, it went very smoothly but also because we're working very closely with Chris and Amy uh, and the union leadership on this this isn't an us document so we document, you know, everybody worked on yeah. it. And even though we've all worked on it, there'll be things to tweak, you know, after we've done it. Mm -hmm. You know, there'll be bumps in the road. Some people say, boy, why did you guys, you know, what were you thinking? But that's all part of the, the process. The feedback loop. Right. right, the feedback. <laughs> Good and bad. So, right, so thank you for that. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, kneecap scores. Uh, this year, um, as you know, is the last year um, that we'll have NECAP, and uh, it marks the eighth and final year uh, for students uh, in grades three through eight to take it, and then at seven years in grade 11. And the reason, for, you know, and what, again, and I know we had the folks down here before, and we're, now we're moving into the, um, the park, is that the first year, and I think if I'm my memory's fading, I'm sure my principals will correct me. We had a, a, a no count year in the first year. It was oh, a baseline DCAP. data. DCAP, yeah. And that sounds that, reasonable. That was, yeah. Well, it was.
different time, different yeah, group of folks. Thought, but but we sense, did, right? there was that year yeah. to create the baseline. Well, Mr. Forrest spoke to that as yeah. well. So uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have that luxury this year. This year, um, I broke it down uh, a little differently because this is really how you see it on the ride reports. They take the last two years and then compare you back four years. So, um, so that's what I did. That's why, you know, in the last couple of years, I had a lot of years. And after a while, it gets noisy. Um, but this is really how the data comes back, um, is printed out. Uh, so what I did was, this is our third grade overall uh, reading. Uh, we're at 82 and the state 69. Um, a little bit of a dip from last year, but for the most part, uh, trending the way you would like it. And then what I did was I took each school. This is a little different from last year. Um, Fort Barton, grade three, had 100% uh, proficient. I've never seen that before. That's unbelievable. That's so all subsets. That's, that's everything. That's, that's across the board, third grade. Is there anybody meeting. else in the state who's managed that? Not, I'm, I don't. I don't know. I don't no. Think so. <laughs> Thank you. That's one of the reasons why I think they were nominated for a Blue Ribbon. Yeah. Um, that might have something to do with it. Might have something to do with it. So this is three or fours? Yes, these are your three. In other words, no one received a two or a one. And uh, Picasso's reading uh, was at 72. It, it dipped um, back to where it was in, in 09. Uh, still 3% above the, the, the average. And I'm just going to click through them real quick because you've had a chance to see them. This will also be online for people to read. Third grade ran ranger uh, reading. Again, above the state average, 77 versus 69. Third grade math, again, this is a composite of all three grades. 77% of our students were proficient or higher, um, well above the, the state average. And again, because we're not doing it anymore, um, this is really just kind of a report out. Uh, third grade math, because it didn't quite get to 100. Have to talk to Mrs. Wardell about that. Um, only get 96 percent, um, 40 percent differential. That's just you know off the charts. Great. Cassett third grade, uh, 10 percent above the state. Cat Ranger, and do you, you want me to do it again for fourth grade, or do you want me to just do the? Like fourth grade reading, and fourth grade math. You want to see the schools? If you if you have them, okay, no, I have them. Through. I got them. Um, Tiverton fourth grade reading did uh, almost hit the ninety percentile, eighty nine percent. Again, we'll have to talk to the principal. Only ninety seven percent in in reading at Fort Barton. Cassett eighty four percent. And again, you can see the differentials well above the state average. Uh, fourth grade reading at Ranger, again, uh, high 80s, 86%. Uh, fourth grade math. And again, this is where you start to see the, the drop in the math, you know, from elementary to middle uh, and to high school, which is something we've talked about ad nauseum. Uh, fourth grade math, 81% versus 63 as a district. And again, you can see growth from you know four years ago, and again, but you can't compare. You're not really comparing cohorts. So. Right, and with small numbers of students. It yeah, it's a small makes it number. Difficult, it's a small more batch. difficult to compare. Fourth grade math, uh, 86 versus 63 percent. Cassett math, 74 versus 63. Ranger, 82 versus 63. Uh, down to the middle school, fifth grade ELA, 83 versus 74. And again, the scores don't really drop off that much from the fourth to fifth grade in, e in ELA. Uh, stay pretty consistent in math. There's a slight drop. <clears throat> uh, this year we saw a, a drop in our fifth grade math for the first time in a number of years. Sixth grade ELA, uh, again, 85% did quite well. Sixth grade math, overall 80% versus 57. Seventh grade ELA, 83, 69. Our math, 77, 59. 
again, that's really the ideal trend, right? What you see there, that upward slope, positive slope. Eighth grade ELA uh, pretty much broke even as far as what the state scored versus our eighth graders scored. Eighth grade math, we're a little bit above the state average. Eleventh uh, grade ELA, uh, our high school students you know, cracked the 90th percentile. I think that's the first time we've ever yeah, done that. that. So it's, this is percentage of threes and fours. This is threes yes. and fours, right? So one. no, the best way to do it is nine. You know, just subtract it. So nine percent were in the twos and ones that took the test. So it was significant. You know, we only had uh, six students <coughs> total who did not receive a two, and they had to subsequently retake it. And have, no, I believe they've all met that second test. 11th grade math, we took a, a, a dip this year <coughs> from 39 to, to 30. Was that correct, Steve? 35 to 30? Um, actually, it's 37 to 30. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Two is partial. Yes, yeah, right. Yeah. That gets you across the, that, that's good enough to get you right through. And 11th grade writing, we did a serious, again, because we didn't score well last year, Peter and his teachers, along with Steve, <coughs> made a renewed emphasis on writing, and you can see um, the results there. And this is, uh, I call this the Burgundy cohort, because Jan asked us to, to track them as groups, and <coughs> fourth grade, eighth, and, and ninth, and you can see the various groups. The black and the red don't show, but the black is the writing. Which is the last one on the right? How many of the eleventh graders got ones in the math? Because that's going to be our. We had a total of forty-five. So back out this thirty-nine, Steve. Thirty. Yeah, I believe we're working with thirty-nine. Um, right away, About we've been trying to work with those kids, and eleven of them already have bank scores. <laughs> we had a lot. We encouraged a lot of, a lot of juniors yeah. this year to quick. take the ASVAB. <coughs> yeah. So they go. They yes. Yeah. Yeah. This year's current junior class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> We're already because we, yeah. we know where we got to go, now, so we can so do we it. Already had the, the bench council <coughs> encourage a certain cohort of kids to participate, and then eleven of them have thanks for us. So we're so starting the cycle again in twenty eight. Because these kids are still gonna need do the yes. Recap. They have to go through that. This we is the second group. Right, right, right. Now we had six yeah. students who who need who took the retest. For the third time on Monday, right. la last Monday. So hopefully, you know they they did well, and we have one student who is going to do the uh, acupuncture. <clears throat> she was sick that the sick for the third retest. Right. And those kids with the bank scores still have to go through. They're they still going to take the October. But they know that they where they can yeah. bank, use their bank score. Right. Okay. But it, now it's just the October one. Yes, and then they'd okay. be done. So there's one retake, and then if you have a bank score, and we're gonna you reach can out. play that card. Yes, right. and we're going to reach out, uh, as we did before, to parents to say, take the AccuPlacer, mm -hmm. you know, we'll do apply ASVAB college. again. Apply to apply college. Apply to college, <laughs> now that we know. For some community college, it's not college of choice. <laughs> they have certain ones you can apply <coughs> yeah, to. Apply to college, that's right. Yeah, there's some school they, up in Canada. No, there's <laughs> one on the board of a Canada. Like so, so uh, again, those are the scores. Um, they did. I, I still, I, I know what the deputy commissioner said about the juniors not having to take it but we haven't heard anything seen anything you know next year's junior class yeah. this year's sophomore is my daughter's group I said plan on taking it until we see it in writing she got all excited yeah. Yeah. that you know as as juniors they'd only have to take one set of tests but I could they're gonna be parked right well because the park exams the 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 results we wouldn't get at the earliest until the summer of 15, summer of 15. Uh, you know, right now we get them That's on next February, fight. So. Yeah. Right. We'll be so here. Hopefully, hopefully, I guess only in a way that this, you know, we'll be going to a new, uh, again, the park, but we may be coming back for one more round on 11th graders. Again, if you look at math, obviously if you look at this data, when you track a cohort, that means how the students progress in, in advancing their knowledge on particular subjects. So basically, from what fifth grade to eleventh grade, we have a drop of what more than fifty percent. Okay. So is this a problem? 
would certainly have a serious problem. How are these kids going to compete in engineering and science fields with everyone else in the world, including in the United States? And that's where, what happens. Yeah, so except we are more and more people. Too. There are serious questions about the difficulty of the math kneecap, especially as comp uh, compared to the ELA. Um, so, you know, if you have a standardized test um, and you decide what your cut score is, for the ELA, it, it, it's just, it, it's clear that it's much easier to get a passing score in, in the ELA than it is on the 11th grade math. And the, the 11th grade math is considerably harder than the, um, you know, the grade 5 and the grade 8. And, and it's not just us, right. it, it's the entire state. Uh, not just Rhode Island. And, and, I, I and it's not just Rhode Island. But it's, but it's and so, yeah. that, you know, this looks, I, I mean, obviously we can all do better in of that. Of course, yeah. But yeah. in my mind, there's a question about the validity of that test. And, okay. it, you know, was it measuring what our kids were actually being taught? Was it a good test? I think the point is it does show, just not for us, you're right, yeah. absolutely, statewide there's a drop. This year we had a bigger drop. We had a, 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 a drop. One of the reasons is how many days were the teachers out, Steve? I mean, this, how many days were the math teachers out? Well, we had three teachers on the on the writing team that missed 15 days last year, and a lot of that was made up geometry, and that was one of the areas that, uh, if you look at my report, there was a drop yeah. off in that subtopic yeah. area. Conversely, we tried to end, we woke. We would be integrated common core curriculum this year. Right. We had a heavy so emphasis that's on probability and statistics. And we, we went up seven percent in that sub. And we also so spend one of those you come It's sorry. still not the kind of scores sorry. that we want to get, but we would certainly have to do um, a true, true um, commitment to reallocating resources in every possible imaginable way to com to make it a competition, to make it a kneecap competition. And we've already we had meet we had meetings on what we have to do to stave off some of the things that we had to deal with last year. So and the we, one have a, we have one more cohort that's got to go through the kneecap, and, and we have to deal with that. Right. When you look at the UCOA, one of the, and I think you brought it up, Carol, is that we spend less per, per pupil than a lot of districts. So obviously that's a question we have to have, or a conversation we need to have, is we need, you know, resources, um, you know, how, how do we add to that number mm -hmm. and make sure it's effective, though, just not to say we're going to spend, right, of course. but come up with a plan. And, um, uh, you know, some of the data is reflected. You know, we have that. Mm -hmm. In other words, we're not spending as much as our, our brothers and sisters uh, that are suburban, um, and that could be a reason why our scores at, at the math level aren't increasing. Mm -hmm. And this year they U-turned, which was um, something that was perplexing to us. but. We weren't. We're not. We're not growing as fast as our other, mm -hmm. dis our, our our suburbans. But <clears throat> you still have that differential. You still have that cliff. But other districts were were making some strides. We weren't making as big as strides. And I think that's what we're looking at mm -hmm. and trying to. And we may have to dedicate more resources in the end to that to right. that to that to right. that area. Right. But it is something, and I, it is something that we can't just. And I agree. I don't think the test is valid, and I could go up and down. But we do see it. Um, you know, our NAEP scores are okay, but you know, we weren't growing. And if it's an unfair test, I understand that. But other districts are making greater right. better progress. So we, so have we to can do so, better. So we know. can do yeah. better. Yes. Absolutely. And I think that's. This argument I heard from a lot of my students, including probably starts in first grade, uh, this is unfair test because they scored low. Uh, everyone has the same test, correct? Are we... Uh, yeah, well, that's what I was saying. Are students said. worse or better? Well, it's on... Assuming, take the premise that it's a faulty test, and it doesn't... It's not meant to measure student knowledge. It's meant to uh, adjust curriculum. It's not as if I... If I'm a math teacher, I create my own algebra test and then assess my students to, 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 to get it right. They put test questions on the kneecap that are wrong questions the kids get wrong. They don't put the questions on that the kids get right. 
when they take when they take it and they do an analysis a lot of the test is they put the harder questions that they struggle with on the test right the way it was designed the way it's designed was, was most teachers don't that I'm aware of you know purposely go out of their way to say I'm going to give them the questions they can't answer well then what's the point of the instruction if that's going to be your assessment method so that's when I say faulty that's that's what I'm talking about but other districts have made progress right so, so we you know in spite of that right so, so we that's have to evidence work on that, that right. we've got to do a better job right I don't think anybody in our school uses the word that this is an unfair test. Uh, I'll be straightforward with that. Um, it's what everybody takes. Um, right. We were making some growth over the last three years, but we still recognized we weren't making the kind of growth that we needed to. Uh, we did a school-wide SLO for numeracy where every teacher in the building made a commitment to teaching kids math in the aspect of their curriculum area. All the math teachers did an additional SLO on teaching fractions. Fractions and multiplication tables are not what they should be. Maybe I need to make some drastic recommendations. Maybe calculators shouldn't be allowed after eighth grade at the high school level. Maybe I need to put two math teachers in every classroom. Maybe we need to mandate summer programs for eighth graders to get a one before they come up to the high school. Maybe I need to mandate that summer school programs aren't counted for Algebra 1 and Geometry unless they're a standards-based uh, summer school program only. We can take hard steps, but we're going to have to reallocate or add some resources. And then we'll do what we need to do to be in this competition. Thank you. There you have it. Okay. That's it. Yes. That's okay. That's a point. It's a February. Problem. Yep. Here's a solution. Yep. We have okay. to. We have to ask the committee. We have to look at this and say, well, if 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 these are professionals who are in the trenches, they we identify the problem. We try to break it to find the causes of this problem, and how we can allocate, what kind of changes we can make, and what kind of resources is going to take. Mm -hmm to address this problem. And then through continuous process improvement, we monitor what is the impact of these changes, mm -hmm. monitoring the cohorts, and trying to make the changes. How are you going to do it? Is that high state testing? You know what I mean? It's, and then it's not to harm anyone, to, but to look at these mega problems, because these are mega problems. And uh, part of this, part of this, actually, and I understand what Carol is saying, because obviously one once you move on in math, the problems become of a different nature because this is trying to solve the problem and follow a particular type of algorithmic thinking as opposed to just following a particular prescriptive way of, of um, adding numbers, multiplying numbers, etc. etc. So things get much more complex. So the whole curriculum, which is kind of a cookbook approach, which the same thing happened in the college level is not suitable to teach a problem solving skill. So now we have the shift <coughs> in the core which is based on problem solving, developing problem solving skills. And these type of skills are basically universal. So you learn it in math, it's going to apply in real life, it's going to apply in science and, and in any other field. Um, and then having the tests, which is part, and I assume, obviously, this is not perfectly aligned, but it's going to align with common core standards, so you are going to test what you are going to teach, and it's going to take time to synchronize these things, but at least we are working with the right paradigm. And everyone is complaining that people who come and uh, um, try to apply for jobs, they don't have basic problem solving skills. <coughs> they cannot make connections. Uh, they might know facts, but nothing else. And that's where the problem is, and that's the problem which supposedly we are trying to address to turn things around. Okay. Thank you. Are you going to reschedule the February? Yeah, yeah this is just uh, FYI. Uh, again, uh, we had a snow day back on the 13th, it seems like years ago. Um, there are two more coming. Stop it, Yanni. Don't jinx it. Uh, we'd like to do it on Thursday, March 20th. And we'll just send out a, a, I didn't send anything out until we talk. Okay. So we'll send something out tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and our, our next. Uh, the next one is the Mighty Mike. At our next meeting, 
I'll have the calendar okay. for next year. All right. And we have the New York Roadrunners? <coughs> yeah, I'll leave that for Ms. Suzette. Suzette. <coughs> The New York Roadrunners run the New York Marathon, and several years ago, they started um, a program with the New York Public Schools in which uh, there are a series of different programs in which children learn to run in the New York <coughs> Public Schools. Now they've extended that program as a national program, and the program is a free program for all schools, all public schools within the United States. And um, as part of the grant program, you don't receive a specific monetary amount. What schools receive is free, secure access to a website in which I would log in and I would keep track of the miles that the children run. And also, teachers and staff members, if they want to participate also, um, I will get a free Mighty Milers banner for our school. And um, as people log in their miles, um, the New York Roadrunners will be sending free t-shirts, they'll be sending some marathon, um, um, little, um, some banners and some little trophies and little things when kids reach certain uh, points. And they also have different incentive programs like um, for March they had Miles for Books Awards so um, when schools uh, ran 50 miles for the month, through Scholastic Books, they received $1,000 worth of free books. Mm -hmm. So they have all different um, incentives um, every single month that they run. So I would like your permission um, to uh, apply for this grant. I would like to run this program during recess twice a week, beginning the, uh, well, if the weather cooperates, <laughs> um, beginning the, the last week of March through the first week of June. So it will be for grades one through four. And the great thing about it is it's called the Mighty Milers. It's not the Mighty Runners, but so it's an all-inclusive program for all of our students so everyone can participate. And um, I'll run it twice a week and uh, during recess. And um, let the permission to apply. Okay. Please. Yeah. It's fine, right? Yeah. It's a great idea. Can you bring? Can you make a motion? Uh, I make a motion to approve the request to um, apply for the grant and start the Fort Barton School Mighty Milers program. Second. Can you bring the banner when you get it? And we'll uh, see it. I will. You know, I'll bring some pictures and stuff. And if anyone would like to come, okay. We'll thank you. That's a great class. idea. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe Cole Hogman could bring it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll book them. Linda's in charge of Cole Hogman. <laughs> All those in favor? Thank you. Okay, is that it? I don't believe we did 5A or B. Okay. Homeschooling backtrack. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We did. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, 5A, and there's two requests, uh, middle school and high school requests that are like uh, yeah. committee to approve. You mean 6A? 6A. 6A, yeah. Second. All those in favor? Okay. And Newport County Mentor Program, Linda, could you please tell about the um, trip to Raytheon quickly? Yes, Linda. <coughs> Thank you. Would you, would you please in the summit near the mic? In the summit coming up. Thank you. Uh, we took a group of students out to um, Raytheon last week. Um, along with um, Portsmouth Middletown, the Met, as well as Rogers. We spent the day um, learning about Raytheon, the company themselves, the engineers, the type of work that they do. Um, the students then got to break up and attend different workshops. So there was a workshop on their cybersecurity unit. They saw Athena and the process of port security um, and when they look at all the ships and bridges and everything else that goes around on around uh, the globe. Um, and they looked at some marine time awareness as well as um, a manufacturing lab where they do the sonar equipment and those kinds of things. Um, so the students had a great time. 
Um, it was incredibly interactive, and the, probably the best part, well, for them was always lunch. Um, they, they did feed them. They broke them up into groups, um, four to five students at a table, and there was a Raytheon employee and an engineer that sat with each one of the groups um, for 45 minutes or so and had a dialogue and an interaction with all the students. So um, they really got to learn kind of about, you know, a day in the life and education and how they got there and those kinds of things. Um, one of the great thing for, things for us is um, two of our students will receive a summer internship um, for, for a week at Raytheon, um, which they're in the process. There was so much interest out of the students that uh, attended. They're applying and they're going to have to write a little essay as to why they want to be considered. Um, and they'll be spending a week at Raytheon every day with an employee and they'll go, be going through their rocketry department and they'll be building a rocket and using the <coughs> software and those kinds of things. So it was a great opportunity. As a spin-off, because cybersecurity was such um, of interest to the students and it's a great career path, uh, we're working with um, Dr. Faye Wolf at URI in their cybersecurity unit. So we're going to be doing some, an additional extension um, with URI on cybersecurity. And I've also talked to uh, um, uh, the, someone at the Attorney General's office um, in their cybersecurity division, um, then they're going to put a little presentation and come out here to the school and talk to our students about cybersecurity. So. And the summit? The uh, <laughs> STEAM Summit Rhode Island, um, yeah. we're planning, yeah. it's yeah. April 3rd <coughs> at the Pell Center at Salve Regina. Um, it's going to consist of three different branches of education, legislators, as well as business people, and it's really to focus on STEAM, the integration of STEAM, the importance of education, um, and science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, and how we all collaborate and how the students are exposed. The, one of the big focus kind of on the, the higher level is um, we have so many industries out there looking for candidates that they're not able to fill positions because we don't have skilled or qualified um, people in, in, in the workforce um, that, that they're able to place. So we're trying to figure out and, and look at Massachusetts and kind of what they've done with their STEAM Summit. We're going to be looking at a five-year manufacturing program and certificate program in Massachusetts. So we're going to look at some lessons learned and some, some successes and then how we can identify solutions here um, with our Rhode Island Department of Education with our legislators as well as our business leaders such as the Rhode Island Marine Trades Association or the Manufacturing Association, Health and Hospitality as well, uh, yeah, Hospitality and Tourism as well as, as Health Care. And we will continue on roundtable discussions along with a conference at the end of May at Rhode Island College with the uh, Rhode Island STEM Director. So an ongoing effort to develop a STEAM Summit in Rhode Island similar to what's happening in Massachusetts. Okay, one last one, the thing for Friday night. The athlete, the student athletes. Yes. <laughs> last Friday night. I thought I didn't know where I was this Friday night. Um, last Friday night, um, the student athlete leadership team that I was here um, about a month or so ago, um, that group um, was selected and we held um, Tiger Game Night. And Tiger Game Night was held Friday night. It was seven to nine. It was free. There was food. The gym was open. Uh, we had to kind of expand and go into the cafeteria or in the commons. Um, the kids played volleyball, basketball, uh, beanbag toss. They had a ping pong tournament in the, in the commons area. Um, Mr. McKinnon, as well as Mr. Phillips, was certainly uh, uh, quite the uh, ping pong champions, or, or so they thought at the uh, beginning of it all. Um, one of the greatest things th that kind of came out of it is the old game of musical chairs, where we actually played musical chairs around the entire gymnasium, um, brought in about 90 chairs or so. And uh, you wouldn't think musical chairs was as competitive uh, as it was, but th we, uh, we had a, a great time doing that. The music was blasting, there was food, all of those kinds of things. We took a group picture, and I've been trying to count, everybody was moving all over the place, but in the group picture, we probably had about 135 students that showed up for the evening, just to spend just a healthy, uh, you know, fun, fun evening together. So, and now everyone wants to know when the next one is. So, <laughs> we're planning. And at the end, I showed them how to play 90s musical chairs. <laughs> you put the chair back to back, you know, 
And then the competition got really rough because at my house, they'd be on the floor crying, it's not fair, you knocked me down. But it was, it was we, we did have a, have a student who took the chair and his opponent. He and, did. He and did. raised <laughs> him up in the air and said, so figured he'd take the chair instead of, instead of the spot. So it, it was, was really it was, a, it was a great time. And uh, Mr. Landock and Mr. Phillips are facilitators um, for, for that group. And uh, they're doing some great things. So, And then we had um, CPR and first aid training for our coaches on Sunday morning that the student athlete leadership team sponsored as well. And they're now called Tiger Pride. So they're coming up with what P-R-I-D-E means to them so that they're in the process of and that. And tell them who came, who made a guest appearance. Um, uh, Tiger came out of retirement. Old Tiger the came big out one. of retirement. The giant the big one, one, one So Mrs. Black continues to carry uh, Tiger around. And Tiger was the center of the group picture. So you'll see some posters. And when uh, Liam saw him come, he said, Tiger's out. <laughs> <laughs> with his bandages and his uh, wraps and <laughs> braces and everything around his neck. So. Well, you, you all don't know, but when we played in the Super Bowl, the opposing team stole him and they ripped his head off so he had to have surgery because all his stuff was coming out of him it was very serious but now he's all wrapped up in his back he came out of retirement I could just say one more thing but actually going back to what you were saying Linda, before I think it's absolutely critical it's a wonderful thing what you guys are doing to try to connect the students with reality what's outside because kids kind of might see it through what parents do but we don't talk about the world but taking them to the real world and showing them why some of these skills they are learning here and they are told that this is important, why these things matter, because if they hear it from those people, it is another connection which will be probably very, very valuable is to, for example, expose them to students who are in college or who are in some training programs. They will say, well, you know what, I was in your place, I hated math, but I wish I would have spend more time studying business because now I see how important it is. Because we do this a lot in terms of uh, bringing alumni, which to these kids, those kids who are already in college, they are alumni for, for their grade. And this speaks much louder than what parents or teachers are telling them. <coughs> um, it's, I think it's a very important thing to do. I agree. The cybersecurity workshop actually brought in four, four interns. Um, not one of the interns ever intended being or studying computer science had an interest maybe a little bit um, one of the young ladies spoke um, and she was in agriculture and she was going to grow tomatoes for a living um, and now she's studying cybersecurity and uh, and has taken a very different career path and it was after being exposed um, with her advisor and talking about the different opportunities so not one of them until they actually spoke to someone talked to someone made it real did they decide to take that particular career path? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any announcements? Tomorrow night is our all course, uh, our all um, band concert here at the high school. Our students in grades five to twelve performing together and alone. Oh, that's and nice. And that's tomorrow night at the school. Um, and our entire seventh grade. Um, cohort of girls will be going to Raytown next week. Uh, a trip sponsored by the Society of Women in Engineering. Uh, PTC is helping to um, fund the buses and so on and so forth. All of our girls had to write an essay on a famous scientist and in order to participate, and they have all complied beautifully. And then engineers from Raytown will come to our campus and offer programming for our seventh grade boys so they don't feel left out. Oh, of course not. <laughs> That's good. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Just briefly, Mrs. Black, the committee is in possession of our financial results through February. I'm not anticipating any problems. We're tracking on budget. We're 64% of the way through our budget and two-thirds of the way through the year. And next, I'll be happy to answer any questions at any time, as the committee knows. And uh, this Thursday, our uh, bids are due for the food management contract, and the interested bidders will be presenting to the East Bay Districts next Thursday in Barrington. Okay. And a decision will be made shortly thereafter. And what communities are we in on with that? Barrington, uh, Portsmouth, Middletown, Little Compton. Uh, in the past, East Providence has been with us, but they opted to go their own route. And Newport also uses the same food management company, but they're on a different cycle, but we anticipate them coming back into the fold oh, good. eventually. Good. Thank you. Mr. Barrett? No? Anybody else? Yeah. Mr. Uh, Fazette? High School and Portsmouth High School will be playing an abbreviated unified basketball game 
at the Ryan Center in between the two state championship games. Oh, wasn't that Saturday. nice? That's so wonderful. Coming up in about two weeks on Saturday. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Okay, a lot of good things tonight.